I'm Bill Anderson. A good a good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm coming live from a very sunny, pleasantly sunny Costa del Sol uh, right now. And I am delighted to have with me um, fellow Scott and fellow expat radio presenter, Fiona Burtonshaw. Fiona, thank you for joining me today. Good afternoon, Bill. It's a pleasure. I, I tell you what, it feels really weird here, here without <laughs> any notes. No idea what you're going to ask me. No idea what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> so help you. <laughs> this is like the, the sort of photographer being on the other side of the camera, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And uh, yeah, I'm probably a bit more nervous about this one than I usually do about my own. <laughs> I know, I know. The, 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 be listen, gentle with me, darling. Be yeah, I'll, I'll be gentle with you, Fiona. <laughs> um, you know, when you're presenting a show, you don't always get to talk very much about yourself. You've got guests on, you're talking about your guests or with your guests about them. Um, fellow Scott, where are you from, um, Fiona? Oh, this is, um, I'm from a wee place called Ochtermachti. Ochtermachti, the same place as the... Um, uh, the Proclaimers. The Proclaimers, yeah. Yeah, and, and for those of us of a, a certain age, Jimmy Shand. Oh, I remember Jimmy Shand. I, yeah. I am of a certain age. <laughs> yeah, well, Jimmy Shand was actually a mate of my dad's. Right. And uh, yeah, but I'm from Ochtermachti. I, I tell you what, the last time I was there, it's changed out of all recognition. Places that were businesses are now houses, yeah. um, you know, and, and new things have opened up and yeah, it's just all different. And I remember years ago, one of my uh, relatives saying, you should never go back. And it's perfectly true because you, you, I hardly recognised it. Yeah, it's it's just different, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm from Edinburgh originally, um, but I, I left Edinburgh 40 years ago. Um, and, you know, I would pop back and forward from time to time for work, but never really spent much time there and, until probably just a few years ago. Um, uh, I, I became a tourist in Edinburgh and it was like I, I couldn't believe the, the, the places where as a child, you know, you don't go down that road, you don't go to this area. And I had become very sort of uh, yuppified and um, posh and uh, really the yeah, changes. I, are... I remember back in the 70s, if you wanted to go south of Edinburgh, it was actually quicker to drive through the centre of Edinburgh than it was to take the ring road as it was in those days. Yes, yeah. But now you, you can't get along. Princess Street, I think, unless you're a bus or a taxi. Yeah, I think that's the case. Uh, you are got to know where you're going. Actually, yeah. um, when when uh, Vicky and I have gone to Edinburgh, I think the first time we went, we, we thought, oh, we'll, we'll rent a car, you know? Mm. And the car sat outside my mother's front door for, for all the time we were there but because there was actually no point in, in uh, trying to drive, as you say, through or, or to the centre um because it changed so much and uh mm. you know yeah <laughs> yeah i you before i before i moved to to france i lived in the south on the south coast of england and the children were still pretty young then and i i took them up to scotland i think probably to see my mother or some family yeah and we'd have a day in edinburgh and i remember my children wanted to have a photograph with the piper at waverley station <laughs> And I'm standing there with this man in a kilt, and I'm saying to myself, I don't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work in Edinburgh, and I'm standing here at the tourist bit with a man in a kilt having a photograph taken. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but, yeah. But, but it is a very strange sensation, isn't it? Go, going back to your hometown well, and feeling like a tourist in it, or, or you know, or being a tourist in it, and, and it's a very different sensation. Yeah, I, the other thing I find quite, quite funny is the different cultures. We... I don't know what it is it's like in Spain, but here, um, we're in the habit, we do the kiss-kiss. Yes. Cheek to cheek, right? <clears throat> and I haven't been here for nearly two decades. It's almost become second nature to me. Obviously not when COVID was, was at its height, but, yeah. you know, in the beginning. And I went back to to uh, to Scotland probably about 10 years ago. And uh, one of my big butch farmer cousins I bumped into him and I immediately went to do the bizu bizu thing on each cheek. And he looked at me and he went, what are you doing? What, are you, what, what do you think you're doing? I said, well, I'm going to give you a kiss. You're not kissing me. <laughs> so, um, well, well, okay. for, for, first of all, you said you, you've been in France about uh, two decades. Uh, I've, yeah. I've been in Spain about the same time, uh, Fiona. And uh, what, what prompted the move to France and why France? 
Um, well, it's I I separated from my husband, my second husband, and I had the two small children, and it was just a case of I really needed to do something more and different with my life. Right. I mean, I had a, a fairly good job. That wasn't an issue. Money wasn't really a, an issue. It was just a case of, you know, I was in my early 40s and I thought, I need to just do something now before the children get to an age where it will be awkward for them. Right, sure. And uh, I came over with a work colleague who owned a property here. Mm -hmm. And I met someone when I was over here who actually lived in the same village as me, but we'd, we'd never met. And that chap is now my third husband. Okay. We've, we've been together ever since. Um, so it was it was more of a, just, it was a time to do something else. Right. Really, you know? And, and, and the circumstances all kind of pulled you towards France? It did. Well, I, I worked in France, in Paris as a student. Okay. Um, so France was a country I knew. Mm -hmm. And I'd been back and forward on holiday and... I kept up with the, the the girl I shared a flat with when I was when I was in Paris. I mean, I'm talking about 1976, you know, so it's, sure. it's a very long time. So there'd been that sort of France relationship all that time. Um, so that's really I just sort of gravitated, and the fact that this work colleague said I'm going over to stay in my house in France for a few days or for a couple of weeks. Right. If you want a few days, come and join us. So I thought, well, why not? So um, children were dispatched off to their dads for a few days and I came over here and just to see what it was like and thought, you know, I could probably just do this and right. that's how it happened. Yeah, um, what, what, what I thought would be quite interesting uh, for, for listeners today, um, Fiona, is if, if we do some kind of comparisons between, um, you know, living in France, yeah. moving to France, living in France or moving to Spain, living in Spain and, and, and to see how, how similar or how different uh, the, the, um, the, the experience is in, in these two countries. Yeah, um, sure. So... Um, First thing I, I want to ask, you know, I, I know Brexit has changed an awful lot of things for uh, Brits, certainly moving into Europe. Mm -hmm. But do, do you think in general, in your experience, or for, first of all, let me ask you exactly where you are in France. I'm um, in the Vendée. I'm sort of in the central Vendée. I'm about an hour from the coast. Right. Um, and kind of an hour from La Rochelle. Right. So is, is that sort of Bay of Biscay area? Uh, well, I, I'm thinking about the yeah. the, the, the sea coast part. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it's the Atlantic coast. The Atlantic coast, right? Yeah. Okay. So th th that's where you are, and and I I I did a little bit of poking around, and you you seem to be in a fairly rural sort of area, yeah. Yeah, we we have our village has a hairdresser and a garage. Okay. And a bread machine. <laughs> just the one bread machine just the one bread machine because the law here in France is that every village has to have access to bread oh right okay so if you don't have a baker you have to have a bread machine or at least a delivery right you know, a baker that will deliver to the village is is, is there a business um, opportunity there for a baker the, there used to be a a bar um, a little bar here and they sold up I think it must be about four or five years ago now. Um, and a British couple bought it and turned it into a, a house. Right. But I know the commune are looking to purchase another property in the village, which would be suitable for a bar, and they're hoping to, to open up. Okay. And I think, you know, you could have a what we call a depot pan. So you could have... If you order your bread the day before, they'll make sure they have it in the day after. <laughs> I love it. Because you can get your bread delivered to the pub. Yeah. And if that's not a great excuse to go for a morning coffee, then uh, I don't know what is. Yeah, well, we, we, we've actually, well, I've, I've taken to making our own bread um, mm -hmm. just at home. And, and we actually very rarely buy bread in, in the, 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 the supermarket or, or whatever any, anymore. So that, that, that works out pretty well. It's just the two of us here. And if I bake a loaf of bread, um, half of it will last us for two or three days and the other half goes in the freezer until we need it, you know. Well, unfortunately, I, I don't eat bread um, because right. I'm, I'm an intolerance to yeast. Right, OK. So I buy the odd loaf for my other half when he needs a sandwich. All right. 
right. he knows when he's getting the bacon sunny because I bought a bit of bread. <laughs> right. So you, you're, you're basically in the middle of nowhere. Um, um, uh... <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't say it's the middle of nowhere. Um, I mean, we do have buses, but they're the school buses. Right, okay. So unless you want to go out at half past six in the morning and come back at six o'clock at night. Right. You do need a car. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, 11 kilometres away, there's there's a fair-sized town, then another 15 kilometres. So, you know, we're, we're pretty well serviced, but uh -huh. it's, it is a rural area. I'll right. give you that. It's it's a rural area. Yeah. But, um, you know, the village itself, I think we have something like 500 maybe in the, the village and then another 500 in the little hamlets. In Around the it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm thinking about people moving to um to to, to countries to uh to, to lifestyle change for, for for everything, um do you think that people do enough research about where they're going to, um I, I'm thinking about France here because I'm sure you've met um a, a other Brits other expats who who have moved to France. And um, do, do you think people do their homework and do enough research before they actually take the step? Some do and some don't. Yesterday, um, I had a couple on Peter and Lucy Barker who moved over post-Brexit. Right. And they did do extremely due diligence on it, but which was great because I met them uh, when they were looking for properties. And one of the reasons I got them on the show was because they said to me at the time, oh, you know, we're in the middle of doing this and we're registering our business and we're looking at doing all this. And they'd done massive research. Um, another chap I've been speaking to recently, he was the same. He Googled areas and looked around. Right. It depends on whether they're coming over to set up a business or whether they're just coming to retire. Sure. Um, and some of the some of the websites are not always entirely clear. <laughs> you know, and some of them tell yeah. you what you have to do, but they don't actually tell you how to do it. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes it's complicated. A lot of it depends on contacts, I think. If you if you're lucky and you fall in with someone who's done it or who's been here a while, then you can benefit from their advice. Um and then we get others who I, I unfortunately had a young couple who didn't this is going back a few years ago and within a few months they had to sell up and go yeah. back because yeah. they couldn't financially sustain being here, which I felt was rather sad. And it was just simply down to going things, going about things, not quite in the right order. Yeah. And, and I mean, we have a problem down here and he's called Bob down the bar. <laughs> ah, yeah, we've got one of them. Yeah, who, yeah, who, Bob in the bar. Yeah. Who, who knows everything and nine times out of ten gets it um, completely, uh, wrong. completely uh, spectacularly wrong and yeah. leads people down the wrong, the wrong sort of information routes, you know. So back, back in the back in the early two thousands, there was a lot of what we used to call Cali builders. Right. Uh -huh. You know, they get on the boat in in, in uh, where is it Dover um, as one occupation and get off here as a builder. Right. Okay. But, Fortunately, these have sort of thinned out a little bit recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've known a lot of people who have moved out here with, well, and I'm talking now pre-Brexit because life has mm. changed completely for, for Brits coming over to Spain. Maybe talk uh, to, to, to see if you know how things have changed for people coming to France. But they, they would come over here, uh, you know, they, they were allowed to, they could get the residency quite easily. Uh, and then, you know, uh, they live for three months like tourists, probably using mm -hmm. up all their savings, and then suddenly decide, oh, I think I need to get a job. I need to do something, and they never really thought about it. You know, the Brits living in Spain, they don't speak Spanish usually, um, mm -hmm. and and it's like, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll get a job somewhere, uh, and that's not that easy either. And you know, after maybe six or eight months, that they, they've said, ah. Oh, I can't make a living here. It's too complicated. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling with the system. And, mm -hmm. and they've just packed up and, and gone back and, and probably lost everything they had just about. Yeah. If, if you've applied for a job over here and you've got it through a French company and you're salaried or if you've been here a long time and you're employed by somebody over here, um, as long as you're in the French tax system, right? then, you know... Um, 
most people come across and they'll set up their own business so they're self-employed. Right. And I think now um, anybody applying for residency needs to show a certain level of income yeah. to prove that they can sustain themselves. I'm not going to quote figures, but I think there is a, a minimum amount and it kind of varies as to who you're talking to. Yeah, well, in, in Spain, um, for people coming over, I mean, the, the, the first thing is that um, they have to come over on what's called a non-lucrative visa. Right. Uh, which, you know, the, the clues in the name, non-lucrative means they can't work. Yeah. So the, the, for a couple, it's about 37,000 passive income they need to have or savings right. for the first year. And then they need double that for, for, for the renewal because the renewal's for two years. Um, and it's not very easy for people to, to get a job, even from a Spanish company, because the Spanish company, because we're no longer EU, has to demonstrate that there is no Spaniard yeah. who is available or capable of doing that particular job. Then they have to apply for them to come over. It's become very complicated for people. Yeah, that uh, sounds a bit like Canada, because many, really? many years ago, I, I spent, my, my dad came from Winnipeg, and um, I was, I went to Canada for a while, and I tried to convince my cousin, who was a, a really tall, yeah. uh, and he said, I can't justify giving you a job. Yeah, because, because you know, a Canadian yeah. could do it. So, yeah, yeah well, can't. that's pretty much the way it is in Spain, that, that there is talk of something called a, a digital nomad visa. Uh, but it hasn't actually hit the streets yet. And, and that would be for people who come over here to work basically online. Um, right. And, uh, you know, possibly even for, for, for a UK based company. Um, but uh, th th there's been a lot of talk about it, but it hasn't actually come into effect yet. Yeah, there are different visas here. Um, you can apply for an extension. You can come for three months. Yeah. If you want to stay any longer than that, now if you're a Brit, you have to apply for an extended visa, six months or a year. Right. And again, you know, there's different criteria for for different. I've got friends who are um, applying to come for a year. They want to rent their house out in the UK and come over here for a year. And mm. um, mm. so they'll have an income from the rental of their house in the UK. Right. And um, they're currently going going through all that. Um, that would be a different system from what the Barkers had because they were coming over here permanently. Right, yeah, um, yeah. So it would be interesting to get my friends John and Jill on to sort of talk about what yeah. they had to do to come for the year. It, 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 it's interesting, though, that there, there, there does seem to be um, a difference b between what is happening in Spain and what is happening in France. It, it sounds like... France is, is being um, a little bit more flexible with the, the, the kind of options that people might have. Yeah, I think, I think that sounds right. The other thing that I heard from a chap who sold his house in Spain and was looking to buy here, he's, he's now decided not to, but um, he said that the reason he sold his house in Spain was he, to stay there, he would have had to have taken out Spanish citizenship. Well, and uh, allow them to keep the dual nationality. Is that true? Uh, yeah, the, uh, it's a, it's a very strange situation because Spaniards in the UK can apply for British citizenship, providing they meet the requirements, yeah. and they can also keep their Spanish citizen, citizenship. I have to say that one slowly. <laughs> um, but um, Brits in Spain are not permitted to have dual nationality um with the uk right so um yeah there are other other ways to stay w without becoming a spanish citizen you know um but you have to go through the, the residency process which since brexit has become very very complicated mm -hmm. and you you also um uh, automatically become a tax resident and that's the bit that sometimes people um don't want they want to keep the tax residency in the UK and they want to be able to come to Spain yeah. for as long as they want, you know? Yeah, we we have a, we, we can have the dual nationality. So if I applied can, for right. citizenship, I could keep my British passport. That wouldn't be an issue. Um, I think both my children are looking at applying for the French nationality now. Yeah. I mean, they've been here since before they were 10 years old. So, you know, it makes, and they're both coming up for 30 now. So right. it makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, that, well, that, that's not possible in Spain. Um, no. you, you, you either yeah, are, you have, you, have your British um, passport or you swap it for a, a Spanish passport. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, uh, without going into to lots of sort of complicated details, it, it, it's, it's, you know, you have to be sure that all, you, all your eggs are in one basket to be able to do that. And, yeah. um, you know, that there's no way back, frankly, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you've been there 20 years. Uh, you, you'd, you'd worked in Paris beforehand, Fiona. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess you, you you speak French. I do. Yeah. I do. I spoke French before I came because um, I did business studies and uh, French and German. Right. Although my German now is reduced to zwei großen Bier, but... But when I came here, even having done it, spoke French in school, so at 14 years old, I started to learn it. Right. And I just seemed to have an aptitude for languages. But even when I got here, I thought, crikey, you know, I don't really know as much as what I think I do. Yeah. Um, and it it's a completely different um, thing when you're here. And I think the best way to, to learn it is to integrate yeah. and to just immerse yourself in it. Yeah. I always um, can tell when it's, when people are learning French from, from an English person who's a French teacher, you yes. know, you'll, you'll hear them speaking French in a Yorkshire accent or something. <laughs> Indeed, and, yes. You know, the best way to do it is just to get to know your neighbours, mm -hmm. chat to them, and you know, to use real French people, and that's when you'll 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 learn. And I, the day I knew my children had immersed themselves in in French life, and they were really happy to be here was when I picked them up from school one afternoon and they were swearing at each other in the back of the car in French. Right, right. Well, I knew that we'd arrived. But, but uh, you know, um, I, I don't know the area where you live, um, Fiona, but um, I, I, I guess it's, it's very French uh, in terms of now, the people who live yeah, in the village and... You there's know, still more French in our village than there are Brits. Right. A lot of the, the houses in our village... Um, that belong to Brits. They're not all permanent homes. Okay. Some of them are second homes. There is a village, one of the prettiest villages in, in the Vendée, not far from here. And I think it, it was bordering on slightly higher than 50% Brits at one time. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are... Um, but the Vendée is a very popular area. And, of course, we've got the coast. Yeah. So people are going to... Sort of generate or, mm -hmm. or what's the word I'm looking for? Gravitate. I have no idea. Gravitate. <laughs> That's it. Gravitate. <laughs> That's the problem. I I forget words. In my work, I have no idea what the technical terms for property are in English. In English, I know. I in UK. Yeah. And I was driving along the road one day with my daughter, and I said, "Oh, there's a Jim Canna going on over there." And she looked at me and she said, "What's a Jim Canna?" And I thought it was a horse show. Yeah. And she said, well, yeah. I had no idea because it was not something that she was familiar with yeah. when we were in the UK. I, I, I got the opposite over here. I, I, I came out here to teach English. Uh, it, it was a big, big lifestyle change for me. Uh, and I ended up teaching German for five years in a Spanish <laughs> hotel school to Spanish, a Scotsman teaching German to Spanish students. And one of the Love courses, <laughs> one of the courses I was teaching, and I actually had some native German speakers in my classes, which was 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 interesting. But I, I was I was teaching a golf course. Dave will appreciate this because I know yeah, absolutely I know nothing about golf other than they use clubs and balls, you know. Yeah. And and, and apparently it's a good walk wasted. And, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they, they were they were asking things like, now I I don't know if, if this is the right terms. A few years ago now, they've probably forgotten it, but they're saying, how do you say um, a, a turf picker in German? And I'm thinking, what's a turf picker? I'm not, I, I don't even know what it. I don't know what it is in English, and I'm trying to find out the German for it. It was it was an interesting experience, sort of mi mixing the languages, you know. Yeah. But I, there's a lot of people over here that I know that have been here nearly as long as me, and they still have very little or no French. And I think uh, that's that's a shame. But but it, it's it's what you were talking about that the immersion part. 
Um, yeah. and, and I didn't realize in the area where you are that there were potentially and um, so many um, Brits there. You know, if, if you come to Mikas, which has a population of about 90,000, um, we're spread over 150 square kilometers. So it, it's not like one big town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 10% of that are Brits. So we have about 9,000 Brits registered here, plus all the Brits that have properties and come back and forward. Yeah. Um, and the, the immersion part is really difficult for some people because they spend all the time in British company. Yeah. Plus, I mean, m m my wife is Spanish. Uh, she does speak English. She lived in Australia when she was young. Uh, and, and she'll go out and people will talk to her in, in kind of very Spanishy English. And she'll yeah. reply to them in perfect Spanish. And then they continue with their broken English and she gets really angry at them. But, <laughs> But um, it, what I'm trying to say is, you know, getting this immersion. Oh, it's, it, it's ever it, so important. It, take, so it important. takes effort, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But, you know, when we arrived here, um, it was just before Christmas, and we moved into a hamlet of four houses, and we were invited next door to our neighbours for Christmas dinner. And we'd only been here sort of 24, 48 hours. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got really quite friendly with them, and... My husband doesn't, well, he speaks a bit of French. He knows lots of words. He can go out and he can buy what he wants and he can get however many of it he wants. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't be able to sort of make a whole sentence out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he, he makes an effort and he can understand if he if people just talk to him fairly slowly, he can get the gist <laughs> of what's coming up. Okay. And um, I, it usually takes me with him anyway. But, he and Guy, our lovely next door neighbour there, they could work all day together. Guy didn't speak any English, <laughs> but they could actually work together all day with yeah. pointing and, and waving their hands around and picking things up and everything else. And it, to me, it was just all part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know, and you make the effort and people will meet you halfway. It's when you say, oh, I don't speak any French. Yeah. Say, oh, well, that's too bad then. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay, Fiona, we're, we're going to take a short ad break. And yeah. when we come back, we're, we're going to pick up on, on one or two things, one or two other things to, to make the comparison between uh, living in Spain and living in France. Welcome back. I'm Bill Anderson, and I'm joined today by my fellow Scot and fellow expat radio presenter, uh, Fiona Burton Shaw. Welcome back, Fiona. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I was just thinking, you know, at the top of the show, we were talking about how things have changed in, in, in our old homes in the UK. Yeah. Um, when I was in Paris first, they hadn't built the Arc de France. That didn't go up until 1991. So even Paris has changed since right. I was last there. Right, yeah. I didn't recognise it either. Anyway. Yeah, well, well um, you know, I have I have been coming to, I, I live just, I live in the countryside, but, but not, not as rurally as you do. I, I'm only mm. about... Um, in the car, four minutes to the coast, uh, um, in, in, into La Cala. Um, but I started coming here in the sort of mid-1990s, um, where the, the, there was a kind of commercial centre, which is built like a, a massive horseshoe um, r r right around the centre of, of the village, which was empty. It was just all empty buildings. Yeah. And I used to live two kilometres out of the village, and it's been creeping up gradually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, You're in oh, the suburbs now, are you? We're, we're, we're pretty much in the suburbs, yeah. Um, so, you know, even in, in the place where we live, it, it's changed dramatically uh, since, since I first came here, say, 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, well, we, we, we've had our roads and our pavements resurfaced, but that's about all that I can say is right. usually, and the bar has gone. Yeah, um, yeah. But then yeah. I opened up my own, so got around that problem. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, listen, how, how um, you know, we've spoken a little bit about language and, and, and our own views on, on sort of getting integrated. You need to speak the language if you want to really be part of the community. But how, how welcoming um, do, do you find France is to foreigners in, in general? Do you find that it's sort of open arms or arm's length? It's basically, well, I personally have found, apart from one instance, it's basically been open arms. Right. I haven't had... Um, Anywhere I've gone where I've thought, oh, you know, I don't think they like us very much. Um, most of the time it's been, but then I could speak yeah. the language and that yeah. makes a difference. But having said that, people that have bought houses 
um, that I've met sort of in the last eight or nine years, um, they've all said, oh, our neighbours have popped in and we're going for an apparel. I think it, it, it very much depends on you making that effort. Right, you yeah. Know, if they're coming to to give you an olive branch, then you know take the other end of it and sure. Say, oh, I, you know, I, I don't speak any French. I don't know what I would say to you. You can still have a laugh, and after a few or four glasses of wine, uh-huh. you know the conversation gets easier. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even if you're all speaking the same language, no one exactly. understands what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, it is if if I mean I I have as I say I, I work in the the immobilier, the, the housing market, and uh, I have the bar, and we have a lot of French customers, right. have a lot of French people buying houses, um, and <clears throat> everywhere I buy stuff, I get it from French suppliers, um, outlets. Yeah. So, you know, it's being able to speak the language has made it an awful lot easier for yeah. me. Um, the other thing that I did, and I would recommend anybody that's coming over here with children, is get involved with the school. Right, yeah. Because that will, A, help you understand the completely different system they have, and it also helps you meet some of the parents. Um, my two went in, well, my daughter was in year six in, in England, and my son was in year five, and they went into the equivalent here. Um, so my son had a year and a half of primary school to do and my daughter had six months and I thought she may have to do her final year again to catch up to go to senior school Sure. but she didn't actually she soaked it all up with a sponge and after the six months she had everything she needed um, to go to, to secondary school with her pals um, and one of the first parents nights there the director of the school approached me and said would you come on our board of governors? Right. Because we don't have a British parent. And we have 12, and it was about 12 or 14 um, British children in the school. And I said, well, I don't know how much use I'll be, but I would certainly give it a go. Sure. And I did. And I was there for the whole four years. Uh-huh. They were, the, they were the, the secondary school. And she went on to Lisey after that, which is a bit like six year. Six uh, form six college. Form, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that way I was able to, to learn what the system was about, the best advantages to take mm-hmm. for them, and also what they were missing yeah. in their education. And because they don't go to primary schools here, don't open on a Wednesday, we only do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. All right. On a Wednesday, we used to do homeschooling. And I would cover the things that they were lacking in right. with them. So that uh-huh. they caught up, okay. and there was two, three times we would do history and geography because the Tudors, history of the Tudors, was no use over here. <laughs> of course um, not. No. You know, um, so we we do things like that, and that's how I learned about the different regions, the different departments, um, administrative, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff, and also a bit of um, French history. Yeah, but but th- th- this being on on the board of governors was also part of your immersion program, even though it you was. spoke. Even though yeah. you spoke French, yeah. um, actually doing things like attending meetings and uh, contributing in meetings is a very different concept than just being in a bar with people speaking French around you, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there was, if I struggled, I, I used to try and sit next to the English teacher. Right, okay. You know, and I used to say to Madame Jouillet, you know, I didn't quite get that bit. Um, yeah. But it's it's also admitting to to say to them, I'm sorry, I'm I'm just. Could you just run that by me again? Yeah. Um, because you can't. Nobody knows everything. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think if you know, and if you have a laugh with yourself and it, your accent, sometimes. <laughs> yes. But it, it's really weird, Bill, because I don't know how what it's like with your Spanish accent. But two, three, you know, when I've been chatting away, um. French people will say to me, I know that you're not French, but I know you're not English. Yeah. I, I've had pretty much the same thing um, yeah. b- b- because our Scottish vowel sounds are very different from the English vowel sounds. 
and they're actually more similar to the Spanish. Right? They're, they're very pure vowel sounds in in uh, yeah. in Spanish. It, it it it's pretty phonetic in in that sense, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 yeah, clearly I don't have a local accent, so people know that I'm I'm, I'm not a local. Um, but they they do puzzle where to put me, and I, b- b- because because I'm fairly tall, I've got blue eyes. They usually go for Scandinavian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it it it, it is a difficult one. But is that, I I got into this immersion process by. Well, I, I worked for a number of Spanish companies. Uh, I worked for a Spanish hotel school, everything done in Spanish. I worked for um, uh, another Spanish university. Uh, and, and then I went into local politics, which is, again, all Spanish. So I, I, I spent a lot of years just immersed in the language. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> My big problem in Spain, I don't know if the same thing happens in France, is that there's like seven conversations going on at the same time in a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that can happen, um, and it's I've I've known French people argue about the best way to say things. All right, okay. You know they say, oh no, you don't say it like that. You can say it like this, and especially if somebody's trying to to find out a foreigner is trying to find out the best way of saying things. Two right. French people are argue about the best way to tell them. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's like, well, who gives a toss, you know? <laughs> exactly. I just want to, I just want to make my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was at a, a security forum uh, last night and uh, it started off pretty well, you know, with an agenda. And within 10 minutes, I, I left after two hours. Oh, but um, yeah. w- within 10 minutes, it had started going off in several different directions. And, and it's like, oh, my God. And I, I, I had... I sure when I have my Liverpool friend on it. Uh, well, I, I had um, Vicky with me, who, say, who, who her parents are from Andalusia. You know, she, she isn't native Spanish. And yeah. I thought, I'm going to bring her with me just in case I miss something. Because when people start having, when people start talking, they go on for hours. You know, it's like you've got to say, right, enough, enough, enough. Yeah. Uh, and and sometimes I just miss the important bit because they've been yeah. they've been talking for fifteen minutes, and I'm not really not quite sure what point they're trying to make. <laughs> um, Fiona, I, I want to ask you that this this is this is a, a bit more sort of practical. Um, I, I, I guess um, it, it's, a, it's an old village that you live in. Uh, it, it, yeah. It's a well-established village, yeah. So yeah, I, our, I, church, our church was built, I think, in 900 Oh, AD. right. And then the English came and knocked it down. So yeah. the church that's there now was built around about 1100. All right. And there used to be a shut... Now, if I'm getting this right, because a few years ago, one of our French... Um, residents did a historical walk around the village and I went on it. So this is sort of trying to get things out of my muddled memory. Right. Um, they knocked the chateau down and they built quite a lot of the properties around with the stones from the chateau. And it became more or less a big farm. All right. Okay. And the I live in what was the barn of the farm. Right. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to change the name because it's always been La Grange. Right. So I can't change the name of it. And nobody else can um, have another one. They've got to have La Grange of something or other. Ah, right, okay. Because we're the only La Grange that's allowed in the village. Yeah. In the um, yeah. So a lot of the buildings are a thousand years Right. You know, originally a thousand well, years old. If, if, if they're still there, it says something about the construction, doesn't it? Yeah, and do you know, this, this is one, one conversation I, I love to have with people when they say, oh, there's a big crack in the wall. And I say, well, it's been there since Napoleon's time. I don't think it's going to fall down now. <laughs> um, and there was an interesting point. Um, a friend of mine said, I was really interested to, to find out that I had a cellar. And I said, you don't have a cellar. He said, yes, I do. He said, because it's on the, the surveys that I've got. We had the diag- what we call the diagnostics done. In right. the he said... It's on the survey, it says it's got a sous vide. I said, no, no, that's not a cellar. That's a foundation. He said, all houses have foundations. I said, no, they don't. I said, mine doesn't. Mine is just built on the ground. It's just stones and mud, and it's built from the ground up. There's no foundation to it at all. But the rules here now are any houses, I think it's since about 2012, I could be wrong on that, but it's around about then, have to be built because we are classified as a moderate earthquake zone. All right, okay. It's from one to five, and we are number three. Right. 
So the rules are now all the new builds have to be um, built to withstand an earthquake. Right. Um, because we do get little trembles. As I say to my husband, I'm still waiting for the earth to move. To move. <laughs> well, we, we, we are technically in, in an earthquake zone because there are quite regular earthquakes uh, mm. out, out in the Mediterranean. But I have to say, um, I, I've, I've not been conscious of them. Um, no, we, we've had, we'll be sitting and you'll hear a, a, like a bang. Right. You, if you hear the bang, you're right in the middle of it. All right. So out from that, you get the tremors. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's it's difficult because um, the the Costa del Sol um, sixty years ago um, was just uh, it was just countryside. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so you know most of the houses, except for a, a couple of small cottages in 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 the village and and Mijas Pueblo itself, which mm -hmm. is one of the the traditional white villages built on the top of a mountain, you know, uh, which has some old um, buildings there. The rest of them are relatively new um, buildings. And yeah. I was going to ask this. Our houses are freezing in winter. And basically, you just sweat everything off in summer. They, they, they don't really seem to be designed for either for winter or for summer. In 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 the in the winter, you go outside to get warm. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Do you have does, that kind of problem? Yeah. I, does that not have something to do with the fact that central heating is not a big thing in in the south of Spain? There or? is no central heating. No. Um, right. But but it it's also just to do with it, with the way where the houses are built. They're, they're not built with with hollow walls and insulation or anything like right. that. You just basically bricks on the outside bricks on the inside and 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 there's there, there's no air gap or anything right, okay. uh, and, no, I, I have to say we, we don't have that problem here um personally our because my husband had a, a quadruple bypass some years ago our house is all like always at boiling degrees as my daughter says right because he feels cold right um, okay but in the summertime because it's very i mean some of our walls are almost a meter thick yeah um, it does keep nice and cool in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, but again, the rules are, are you know, are always changing for for building properties up here in France. And from around 2025, they're becoming very ecologically um, minded, and all new builds will have to have solar panels installed right. in their roof. Yeah, they're, they're kind of moving in that direction uh, here in Spain as well. Um, but I, I, I think the the ecology part of it really is about, mm -hmm. you know, about having uh, and the hot water panels or something like that. I don't think they've quite gone down the photovoltaics um, direction. Mm -hmm. so, so so people would be responsible for doing that themselves, basically, you mm -hmm. know, which is a very expensive uh, project to take on. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, with old houses, even like ours, is you'll always have an element of dampness. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know. Um, which modern French houses won't because they've got mm. damp courses and they're built differently. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we get, we've got a couple of little areas in our place that we will get saltpeter on and you just sure. you know, you, you kind of have to live with it, really. It's yeah. just all part of the charm. Yeah, well, we, we actually have the same thing because uh, I, I, I bought an old, can, uh, when I say old, uh, um, a house that had been built for families just to spend the weekends in and it mm. was built just with breeze blocks and uh, so uh, <clears throat> I, I, I have problems with, with the, uh, the saltpeter sort of um, eking through on, on rainy days, you know. Yeah, but I, I think a lot of people don't understand that houses, um, they're almost, when they're built of natural stone and, and mud and, and old houses and timber, they're an actual living thing. Sure. And move. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, we, we, we've only got a few minutes left for you, and I found this very interesting, just sort of comparing things. Is France very much home for you now? Oh, my goodness, yes. The last time I went to the UK, I drove up all the way up through England to, to the north of Scotland, and I thought, if I break down, I have no idea who to phone. Right, yes. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it, it just, yeah, yeah, it just, you know, where, where'd you go for this? Where'd you go for that? And, you know, because I'd gone back maybe a few times to see my mother. She died 12, 10 years ago now. Right. Um, so visits have, 
I think I've only done two visits since then. Um, I, I just don't know. It's just, it's just, a, it's a foreign country now. Seriously. Yeah. Well, 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 listen. The first time I took Vicky to visit Scotland, and, and that was kind of when I started doing my touristy thing, you know, but because yeah. I, I was a tourist with her, showing her places, and she said, "Oh, it's so beautiful. I'd love to, I'd love to live here." And I said, "Sweetheart." you wouldn't survive the first winter. <laughs> oh, no, no. I have to say, I do not miss the rain. Right. Yeah, and I, I spend most of the summer taking little videos of the blue skies outside my front door and sending them off to the few friends I have left. That, that is, <laughs> because a lot of them have stopped talking to me. That now is really the cruel. The blue skies are... Yeah, they, they, they deserve to take you off the, off, off the birthday <laughs> list, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try not to be too smug. It doesn't work. Uh -huh. Okay. No, I love it here and I wouldn't love it anywhere else. Yeah. What, what, just very briefly, what's your favourite thing about living? When I say in France, it's really about the part of France that you live in. What, 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 is, what is the thing that, that you know, just uh, feels just, right to know, you? It's just, it's just the fresh air. Right. And the atmosphere. Yeah. That's all I can say. It feels, you know, the air is clear. Um, yeah, it's just the fresh air and the atmosphere. And I go out and people in the village will say hello. The children, even if you don't know them, will say bonjour, madame. It's just the culture. It's it's just the whole thing, to be honest. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's just home. I, yeah. I don't know what else. I also describe it well. Well, I, I couldn't describe it any differently. Um, you know, for, for me, um, uh, we're, we're, this is home. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever lived 20 years in the same place prior to this, you know. I, mean, um, I didn't live any more than two years in the same house until I moved into this one 12 years ago. <laughs> so uh, um, we've just got a minute or so left. T tell us what's on your menu for the weekend at the restaurant. Oh, we've got um, some spicy pork. Right. Um, and the steak. Steak goes down really well. Steak and chips. French really? love it. Yeah, seriously. I don't think it's something to do at home. So oh, okay. it come out. And this week, fish and chips. Very French. But the French <laughs> love it as well. So we'll have that maybe once every four or five weeks. We'll do fish and chips. Right. Um, yeah. So that's what's on the menu this weekend. Okay. And um, do, do you do home deliveries? Uh, well, to, not to Spain. Not to Spain. No. Sorry uh, about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it looks like we'll just have to cook something. You'll just have to come up. Listen, Fiona, it's been an absolute joy having you on um, today and, you? Uh, and, and being able to sort of compare notes a, a little bit between um, Spain and and France. And uh, well, I hope you have a good and busy weekend. Thank uh, you. In, I'm in the I'm restaurant. Good weekend too, and my love to Vicky. Yeah, and um, you know, it, it's been very nice. The pe people people don't know this, but it'd be very nice to see Mister Halewood today. Yeah, for the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> he's kept his eye on me as well. It really. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Well, listen. Thank you so much, Fiona. Have a great weekend. Thank you, you to everyone who's been listening in. We'll be back next Friday at one o'clock, uh, live from the Costa del Sol. Take care, everyone, and have a great weekend.